Feuerbach was quite willing to agree with Schleiermacher that religion is the feeling of absolute dependence. Remember Schleiermacher from yesterday? Religion is the feeling of absolute dependence. Feuerbach said that's right, but the dependence is on nature, not on some alleged abstract, immaterial, supernatural being. So the essence of Christianity, you need to remember as you look at the course of Western <coughs> philosophy, the essence of Christianity is a high mark of theological disdain. Theology reduces to anthropology. Religion comes from human projection. You've probably run into that all the time. Well, it's Feuerbach who especially systematized that outlook. The second scholar that I want you to know under this broad rubric of materialism and positivism is the man who came up with the word, the term, positivistic or positivism, Auguste Comte, 1798 to 1857. A few moments ago I told you there was a British empiricist who supported Comte, except for his social engineering. Who was that? John Stuart Mill. He wrote a book on him. Auguste Comte, 1798 to 1857. Uh, his father was a French tax collector. He lived most of his life in poverty and poor health and suffered through an unhappy marriage. The last nine years of his life, however, were um, he enjoyed a public subsidy. Comte is called the father of scientific sociology. Well, the father of sociology, but sociology not just as reflections on society, but scientific sociology. He had certain things in common with the utilitarians. Well, a utilitarian wrote a book about him, so, but he had more than that in common. The reason why they had a mutual respect is that they shared a certain outlook. He agreed with them that the development of science makes possible for man an improvement of his environment. He agreed with them that the level of knowledge about <clears throat> physical nature should now be applied to man in his social problems. Both utilitarians and Comte said, it's really a shame that we've advanced so much in understanding nature. We need to take those same principles and now apply them to man and to society. And so to put it very simply, and now I'm being critical, what he shared with utilitarians was a naive belief that it's a relatively simple and direct project to apply empiricism to man and society. I've already just, dev I hope, devastated utilitarianism in its alleged rational approach to legislation. Well, Comte shared with them that naive idea that if you just be empirical, we can put everything in order. Yeah. According to Comte, most men don't act rationally. They don't live by long-range intelligent analysis. They're rather dominated by emotion. You have any problems so far? I think that's true. Most men refuse to be, you know, accurate in their analysis, think through the consequences, look down the road, be rational, as we say. Most men are dominated by emotion. That's why we have ad campaigns. Am I right? I'm not talking about whether the government should intrude into the freedom of expression. I'm not for that at all. That horrifies me. But on the other hand, if you just look around you, watch TV for a half hour, look at the paper, look at billboards and so forth, and say, what does this tell you about human nature? Is human nature rational? If human nature, pardon me, if human nature were rational, then we would ask ourselves the critical question, is this woman who is advertising this makeup or this health product or this diet regimen or whatever it is, has she actually become that beautiful by using this product or this regimen? Do we ask that question? Do we even care? We don't care. We want to be lied to. 
if I can be more Nietzschean and hammer away here, we want to be lied to. We want to look at this and have people who promote the product. I mean, she's talking. No one ever says, you know, by the way, this is how I got this, what, beautiful skin or hair color or whatever else is being advertised. You just look at it and say, boy, what a beautiful woman. <laughs> Is that rational for crying out loud? It's not rational at all. How about politicians? Politicians, you know, push all these high, noble-sounding things, all this rhetoric. Does anybody really care? I mean, unless you're the opponent of the politician. We want to be lied to. So Kant looks, I mean, he didn't have TVs and that sort of thing, but Kant looked around and he said, most men are not governed by reason, they're governed by emotion. I think he's right. He said only a few people, only a few people can coolly use the scientific method to work out solutions to society's problems. Okay. Will. That's enough. Only a few people can coolly use the scientific method to work out solutions to society's problems. You know what the critical word for that is? Elitism. Comte was, in some ways, like Plato. Plato believed that the philosophers should be the kings. All these other people who are driven by different forces other than reason, you can't trust them to rule society. Comte agreed with that. Of course, he didn't want the philosopher king in the Platonic model, he wanted the philosopher king who used empirical scientific methods. According to Kant, social administrators will secure conformity from others, however, by appealing to their sentiment. That is, they'll manipulate people who are governed by emotion anyway, so appeal to their sentiment. And in that way, you can produce a tightly controlled and organized society so the philosopher kings, here the empirical philosopher kings, the elite intellectuals, are to control society very tightly and organize it, but they secure the, um, the following of people by appealing to their emotions and sentiments. And in order to accomplish that, appealing to people, you're going to love this, Comte invented an elaborate religion. He invented from scratch a religion to be used. This religion would be designed to encourage socially acceptable behavior by arousing a feeling of unity for humanity. And it was quite elaborate. He had rituals. He had a new calendar. Um, I think the, the, the new months of the calendar, was a 13-month calendar, and um, some great individual would be the name of the month. I may not have it right, but it's like, you know, Leonardo month and stuff like that. And, um, and the rituals of this religion would all be encouraged to, uh, to build up respect for humanity. According to Comte, God is humanity. 1852, he wrote the Catechism of the Positive Religion positive here doesn't just mean, you know, like affirmative rather than negative. Positive in that empirical sense. The catechism of a religion that's based purely on science. Where humanity is seen to be God. Alright, let's move ahead. Auguste Comte also aimed to show that the social process when it's studied empirically, conforms to law-like behavior. That is to say, there is a history to the development of the social process. Empirical study confirms the law-likeness of all social development. Indeed, he said, every branch of knowledge develops through the same three stages. And you're going to want to get this in your notes. This is crucial. Because he's a developmentalist, and this is the spirit of the age. Historical approach to all branches of knowledge. 
every branch of knowledge, whether you're looking at philosophy, you're looking at physics, you're looking at uh, geology, whatever it is, every branch of knowledge <clears throat> develops through three stages. And what distinguishes the three stages is the kind of explanation that's used at each stage along the line. The first stage for every kind of, uh, every branch of knowledge is the theological stage. In the theological stage, explanations are given by means of volition. That is, everything that happens is accounted for by a choice, a volition, either of the gods or of individuals or nature as a whole. So you have the theological way of thinking, explaining things teleologically. I didn't say theologically. Teleologically, in terms of aim or purpose, a choice made to try to accomplish something. So now everything's explained by volition. The second stage of development he called the metaphysical stage, where you explain things by abstract principles or concepts. Not by volition, not by choices made by gods and men, but by abstract concepts. The fact that this is the second and not the final stage tells you what Comp's attitude is toward metaphysics, right? Get out of here. That's just low-level development. We have to get beyond metaphysics. So in that way, he was like Kant, metaphysical knowledge is impossible. We're just messing around. A critique of pure reason is necessary to show that metaphysical knowledge is not possible. What's the third level? in the development of every branch of knowledge from the volitional to the abstract principle approach to explaining things the third level is the scientific now hold on to your hat sports fans the scientific level is characterized by not offering explanations the positive approach does not explain anything it abandons explanation for mere description the job of science is not to explain why things happen, but simply to describe what and how they happen. According to Comte, there is nothing to explain. All we have are temporal relations between events. So here's an event, here's an event, here's an event. I experience this quality, I experience this quality, I experience this quality, and there's temporal relations. There's before and after, or these things are simultaneous and so forth. And all science does is it amasses these sorts of things. All of our experiences are just put into the, um, into the computer. You know, and we do the statistical analysis and the relationships in time, and that's all science does. That's the positive approach. No explanation merely description. And the assumption here is that reality is the time-space realm. There's nothing beyond it. There is no metaphysics beyond it. Reality is the time-space realm, and it's known phenomenologically, or if you will, positively, positively. For Comte, the time-space realm, as it appears to us, is the way the world really is. So Comte was quite antagonistic to Kant. You have to listen closely. Comte versus Kant. There may be a question on your final exam. <coughs> you know, I may just say Kant versus Comte. Explain. Well, Kant felt there was something beyond the phenomena, the real world the ultimately real world, Comte said the phenomena gives us all there is to reality, time and space, the time-space realm. A couple of criticisms, real quickly. I hope this is the sort of thing you might have seen yourself. <clears throat> Let's ask ourselves about the law of three stages. Comte has this law of three stages. Every branch of knowledge develops through three stages. Is that a purely empirical description? The highest level is what? The positive level, the scientific level. 
No explanations, just descriptions, posits, experience. But when he offers as a law that everything develops in this way, is that something that is just the positive of his experience? Yeah, he's giving us a generalization, and it's metaphysical, at least in the sense that it explains reality and the development of men's thinking. And so Comte refuted himself in the process of offering this. He gave us a law of development, and according to him, the development shows us that no laws are possible. No generalizations are possible. We only get individual posits of experience correlated mathematically and temporally. And then secondly, by way of criticism, notice the overwhelming arbitrariness. And I don't mean to criticize you as students when I say this, but you didn't even you didn't even stop to question this. And the reason for it is because it's part of our zeitgeist. The spirit of our age leads us to take this for granted. But now we're going to stop and ask, why is later better? The law of development says you have three stages. Theological, metaphysical, scientific. Okay, even if that were right. From a positive standpoint, I don't think he had any you know, any justification or warrant for saying that. But even if he did, why do we evaluate the later stage as superior to the earlier stage? Because we have bought as a primitive cultural myth the notion of progress. And therefore, later is better. We automatic. that's why I'm saying, I'm, I'm not trying to put any of you down, but when I presented that, you wrote that in your notes, you understood that, yeah, sure, because everyone takes that for granted. Progress, progress, progress. Why? I want to be a philosopher. The examined life. Well, let's examine that. Why should we think that the third stage is superior to the first? Isn't it just as possible, as a hypothesis, that you have a superior approach, theology, that degenerates the metaphysics and finally degenerates the science? Okay, so notice that Comte refutes himself and he evidences arbitrary assessments in the name of philosophy here. But let me go on to describe his approach to society a bit more. He called his view positivism. I've already told you that. Science doesn't show why things happen. It only generalizes as to how they happen. Positivism is not an instrument for describing the truth as it is. Positivism, he said, is an instrument for controlling. You want to describe things scientifically, why? So that you can control the outcome. You see, there's another parallel to British utilitarianism. We want to study pain and pleasure, quantify this so that we can do what? We can control society. Of course, the the, the British utilitarians wanted to maximize individual freedom. Comte has the same mindset, but what's he want to do? He wants to maximize state control. It should be used to develop a kind of social physics. You know, positivism is like physics. It studies just what we find out in the world and correlates our experiences mathematically and temporally. It's a like physics. And so here you have social physics. I would remind you of Bentham's term, legislative arithmetic. What's going wrong here, sports fans? What's going wrong is that empiricists are trying to impose a model of explanation and thinking on all aspects of life. And they're naive, and when they do it, what we have left is pseudoscience, social physics legislative arithmetic. In Comte's view, liberalism and democracy are stuck at the metaphysical level of development. Every liberal principle is only a dogma based on abstractions. And when you follow those liberal principles at the metaphysical level of abstraction, 
what they play out into is incompetence and ineffectiveness in society. That's true, isn't it? You can't deny that. Liberal principles are not the most effective way to govern people. If you think what goes on in the United States Congress is effective, you're really infected with prejudice, it seems to me. All of that debate, everybody worrying about being reelected and so forth, you know, interminably. Now, I don't, I don't want the government to control health care, so don't misunderstand my illustration. But if you believed that the government should do that, you probably would rather have a benevolent king impose it than to watch what's going on now, where everybody's got their plan, everybody's debating back and forth, everybody's trying to satisfy their special interest group and so forth. These liberal principles of democracy, are they effective for governing people? Comp said, of course not. They get in the way of uh, effective, scientific, rational social planning. Liberalism is incompetent. And that's why positivism endorses as a scientific conclusion that society should be controlled by experts. <coughs> and I just have two passing criticisms of that. They're devastating, but you understand them, so I don't have to go at great length. Oh, yeah, positivism gives us experts, but what the experts are following is pseudoscience. Pseudoscience, this naive empiricism. The pseudoscience that says there's a law of development, and the development shows that there are no laws. Great. Pseudoscience. And secondly, are the experts morally superior or just intellectually superior? Now, I've just said I don't think they're really intellectually superior because they have pseudoscience, but the question is are they morally superior? Okay, so we've looked at um, Feuerbach, who said theology is anthropology. And we've looked at August Comte, who said that God is what? Humanity. Do you see any parallels there? The secular mindset. God is dethroned. Man is what's left. Even a religion of man. Not everybody's been as bold as a comp to have a religion of man, but he did. My third, my third explanation, my third illustration of that secular mindset, what I have said in your outline, what I've called materialism, positivism, and evolutionary naturalism, is Ernst Haeckel, H-A-E-C-K-E-L, Ernst Haeckel. H-A-E-C-K-E-L, who lived from 1834 to 1919. And I have to be real clear here, he's just one of many. He happens to be particularly well-spoken and published a lot and has a reputation. But it's not like he was the guy who came along and got people thinking this way the first time. He's just an illustration of a whole group of people that... Um, can be described as following the view of scientism or materialism. Scientism or materialism says there is no noumenal realm. The only thing that's real is the phenomena of experience. The phenomena of experience. Reality is the space-time realm. You know, that's what Comte said as well as a positivist. And current scientific theories are taken as the ultimate truth. Now, can I do an internal critique real quickly for you? I just I want you to learn this, this technique. Haeckel and the materialist were evolutionary in their outlook. Everything develops. Okay. They also believe that ultimate truth is found in scientific theory. But notice what I said in my description a minute ago. Current scientific theory. If everything evolves, scientific theories evolve too. And so this naive approach of scientism that says ultimate truth is divulged to us in current scientific theory, and current scientific theory is evolutionary, leads us to say that current scientific theories are going to be replaced by 
further scientific theories, in which case current scientific theories are not ultimate reality, are they? You're beginning to see how you do this? Over and over again, you take the premise of your opponent and you, you use that premise to refute him. He contradicts himself, given if you understand what he means by this. It ha if, current, if science is the guide to truth, and science tells us everything evolves, then science is going to evolve and it can't be the guide to truth. But nevertheless, materialism, scientism, is a very naive philosophy. I hope you can see that. Here's the devastating thing. It is naive, it is philosophically disrespect, I mean, it shouldn't be respected at all. It's easy to refute, and yet it dominates our culture. You, you scratch an ordinary Englishman or American, ask them, how do you know what is true? They'll say, what science says. Man, that's naive. What's real? What I can touch. You know, don't give me abstract things, ghosts and souls and God and, and even causation and so forth. I don't want abstract theories. What's real for most Americans and most Englishmen is what you can see, what you can touch, what you can hear. Reality is the material world, and how do you know it? What science tells you. Well, Ernst Haeckel is an, uh, a nice illustration of this materialistic view, or if you will, the view of scientism. He was a biologist at the University of Jena. He wrote a number of books. I'm only going to give you two to illustrate. One, um, The Evolution of Man, 1874. Another, The Riddle of the Universe, 1899. And let me quote. He said, The universe is eternal, infinite. Its substance, with its two attributes of matter and energy, fill infinite space and is in eternal motion. Well, laid out pretty plainly for you there. What's real? The universe. The universe is characterized by time, excuse me, matter and energy, and that's what fills infinite space. Matter in eternal motion. It's just a straight out naive materialist. He called his view monism. Monism. There is no God, he said. There is no immortal soul. There is no free will. All is matter <coughs> in eternal motion. Matter in eternal motion. Haeckel said, and I quote, the same eternal iron laws that rule in the inorganic world are valid, too, in the organic. The same eternal iron laws that rule in the inorganic world are valid, too, in the organic. The significance here is that he said, what you study in physics, chemistry, the laws of physics and chemistry apply in biology, the organic world, as much as the other. And then another quote, he said, ultimately life can be unequivocally explained in physiochemical terms. Physical, physico-chemical terms. Ultimately life can be unequivocally explained in physico-chemical terms. Well, I'd like to take a shot at criticizing this. And I put it to you that sarcastic way because I hope you see how easy it is to bring this down philosophically. According to him, what is the universe? Matter in motion. Matter in motion. And then he says, the same eternal iron laws rule in the inorganic and organic worlds. Pardon me? And he says, any, uh, unequivocally, we can explain things. Well, I'd like to show a little bit of equivocation here. If there are iron laws, I take it he meant that metaphorically. He didn't think the laws were made out of iron. 
But like iron, there are laws that govern, right? But what I want to know is, are these laws matter in motion? <laughs> Ernst Haeckel wrote a lot of stuff. I guess was paid a lot of money to be a professor. Has quite a reputation, and it took us 35 seconds to refute him. That's not because Dr. Bonson's real smart. It's because he's promoting a worldview that is foolish in the eyes of God. But I hope you can see this is the nature of the criticism. Let's take what he says and turn it against itself. Everything's matter in motion, and there are iron laws that explain everything. Well, there can't be iron laws if everything's matter in motion. First place, there can't be laws because they aren't material, and they can't be iron laws because everything's in motion. <laughs> So everything he thought could be explained in terms of machine-like compelling mechanism. Machine-like compelling mechanism. For him, Darwinian evolution was the key to all philosophy. It's not hard to refute his materialism, and it's not hard to refute Darwin. But it was the key to philosophy for Haeckel and many others. And again, I just have to share the burden that's on my heart here. It is not difficult to refute these people. This is philosophical nonsense. It's self-contradictory. And yet it governs our culture. Haeckel can be refuted, but the vast majority of people in our culture would say that he's right. Let me just show you how bad his philosophy is. He said that everything can be accounted for in terms of the laws of physics that required him to hold the spontaneous generation of life. Spontaneous generation of life is anything but a scientific thesis. And then, how does he account for man's consciousness if everything's matter in motion? Well, as you know, consciousness doesn't seem to be matter in motion. How do you account for it? Haeckel fell, fell back on the view of Leibniz called panpsychism. He said all matter has consciousness in it, and that's why man has consciousness. Now, does that strike you as a really intelligent and scientific approach to things? Spontaneous generation and panpsychism. It's like Haeckel said, I can rationally explain everything if you just give me a little bit of irrationality over here. If I can bring in spontaneous generation and panpsychism, then I've got a fully empirical account. Well, hey, big deal. You've just violated your empiricism by your spontaneous generation and your panpsychism. To put it very simply, the scientism or materialism of the 19th century, and it comes over into the 20th, obviously, is... Nothing more but sweeping religious dogmatism based on faith commitments. Sweeping religious dogmatism. This is not the result of study. This is a presupposition that controls your study and your outlook. And it's full of faith commitments. He was sure that life could be accounted for on physical terms. You say, okay, go ahead and do it. Give us time. Oh, it's a faith commitment then. This is not an empirical conclusion. This is a program that you have full faith is going to be worked out. Well, I have faith we're all going to stand before God on the day of judgment, and there's going to be eternal life and eternal judgment, death for people. He would say, oh, that's metaphysical nonsense. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But he's got a faith commitment too, doesn't he? He is just as dogmatic, just as religious as I am. The difference between us is not I'm religious and he's scientific. The difference between us is that we have different religions. And when we come back, we'll finish this lecture, which I had hoped we could do, but I don't think time will allow it today. We'll finish this lecture and, and apply it to the Darwinian philosophy that is probably the most important cultural factor in the last 100 years or more. And I'd like to apply the same vigorous critique to what I think is a foolish outlook philosophically called evolution. <laughs>